and away we go. Welcome, Dr. Schreier. Oh, thanks, Dave. So some of this will be, uh, those who heard the first talk will be a little bit of repetition, which isn't a, a bad thing. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit more background about myself. So I, I, I started in medicine and uh, I graduated, practiced for a few years and then I got bored and I did a PhD in physiology. Uh, so basic science and <clears throat> physiology is all about causes. Um, and then I started to do epidemiology because I couldn't get a grant to work on humans because I my training was in animals. Uh, so I did a postdoc in epi, uh, and then I had questions, and I would basically didn't like the way textbooks were saying things. So I would go to my colleagues who are statisticians or senior epidemiologists, and I would ask them questions. And most of the time, they told me I was stupid. And uh, once in a while, they'd tell me that, oh, that's a good idea, and we'd write a paper. And the problem was I was getting an idea a day that's 365, and you figure if it's 1%, that's still, you know, some, or, or like whatever, a few percent, I'm still getting too many ideas um, for them to help me. So I've got all these ideas and we've worked through some and a lot of it came all about the causal inference as a clinician, when I see somebody and I wanna treat them, I have to treat the causes. I can't treat markers for the causes. I mean, we know for instance that um, Caucasian people, have more osteoporotic fractures than non contagion people. Okay, that's okay, but we could also say that blonde haired people have more fractures than non blonde haired people. But if we just color people's hairs, that's not going to affect anything. So when we're trying to affect the treatment, it's always about the causes. Um, so in this overview, first half will just be some basics. And the second half will be understanding causes. We'll uh, take a break in between the two. The saying, if you think you understand something, it's only because you don't know enough about it. Um, to show you how important causes are in sport. Um, this is now my favorite video. I think I showed this the last time as well. So here's just a high school football game. Now think about what happens here? The coach, oops, I thought that would just reverse. Uh, where's my mouse? Now, that's not working. Sorry, guys. Hold on. Let me just try it this way. I've lost my mouse. Hold on. Oh, that's not good. Okay, here we go. Um, what causes the defense to react in a football game? It is usually when the ball is snapped between the snapper's legs and the front line takes off and the defense reacts to that. And the coach said, hey, if I stop my front line from reacting and I give the quarterback the ball a different way, maybe the defense won't react. That's understanding the cause of the defense reacting. And they just look, they don't know what the hell's happening. Everything we do when we want to affect uh, any intervention we do has to attack the causes. And so that's true in injury, it's true in performance as well. And I think, in one of the first talks uh, that was given in, in the sport analytics session was about soccer and crossovers. I don't know how to play soccer, but crossovers and how do you, you know, when is the crossover a good play or a bad play? And it's gonna depend on context and what people are doing. Again, you're trying to think about causes. So first we're gonna talk about confounders and how they, and what's a confounder and people use that term in different ways. In epidemiology, uh, we have a very specific meaning for a confounder. And if you look up in the textbooks, uh, it's a variable that may affect the magnitude or direction of the actual effect that you're measuring. So we're trying to measure a true effect and yet we're trying to estimate it. And if there's a variable that gives us, a, that changes what we measure and it's, we're no longer measuring the true effect, we might call that a confounder. So if the variable is associated with the exposure, 
and associated with the outcome independent of exposure and is not affected by exposure that uh, in particular does not lie along the causal path from exposure to outcome, then we'll call that a confounder. And these are the standard things that you'll see in textbooks. The first two for sure, people often forget the third, uh, but the third is, is clearly usually in that same section in any good textbook. But the problem is that those three conditions are not enough to define a confounder. In fact, if you look through the books and you look at other sections, you'll find some other statements. So here, this is what they were talking about. We have osteoarthritis, and you, I put activity here, but you could think of performance if you want, gait disorder. And so we have these three variables. And we're interested whether osteoarthritis affects your performance or activity or whatever. And if you have osteoarthritis, you're likely to limp. And if you limp, your performance or your activity is gonna be decreased. So we have associations here and associations here. It's not lying along the causal pathway, we don't think, we're not sure. Um, so is that a confounder? Well, let's look. There's also, it must not be a marker for a variable that's on the causal pathway. Very important. So it can't be on the causal pathway or be a marker for something that's on the causal pathway. Now a marker is something that's just associated. So if every time a variable is, variable A is one, variable B is one, then that B is a marker for A. And if 80% of the time B is one when A is one, then B is a marker for A, just not as good a marker. It can't be caused by the outcome. If it's caused by the outcome, it's not a confounder. And you can't, you're not supposed to condition on things that are caused by the outcome. It's got to cause disease in the unexposed group and yield true risk of disease in exposed and unexposed. These, these two are kind of truisms. We don't have to get into the nuances there, but we're going to focus on these three sentences. It's not affected by exposure, in particular, it doesn't lie along the causal path, not a marker for a variable on a causal path and not be caused by the outcome. And what I wanna show you is that this is traditional epidemiology that only talks about association and Fisher, who was a famous statistician, was a completely against causal language and all we could do is association. I'm gonna go through these sentences with you one by one and show you that in fact, the traditional approach is only talking about causes it's just hidden and you're not seeing it. And because you don't see it, you then forget about it and then you end up making misinterpretations. When I say you, I mean we. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> here's the example we had before. And we don't know if this covariate is a confounder, should we include it in our model or not? Now, let's look, we have our exposure outcome and our covariate. We have this sentence says the covariate can't be caused by the outcome. All right. If the covariate isn't caused by the outcome, but it's associated with the outcome, there are only two possible alternatives in the universe. That's it. Either the covariate causes the outcome, that would create the association, or there's something else that causes the outcome, and the covariate is a marker for that. So again, the covariate in this case, we see an arrow going either way. So we don't know whether the covariate causes you or you causes the covariate. Well, let's think about that for a sec. Why doesn't that matter? Well, if the covariate causes you, then the covariate is causing the outcome. It's just causing it through another variable. So it's a cause of the outcome. And if you causes the covariate and every time you is one, the covariate is one, then the computer that's doing the stats doesn't matter whether it's you or covariate, they have the exact same number. This is a very important thing about statistics is that the computer never knows what the titles at the top of the columns mean. So you have an Excel sheet, you have SPSS, what the variable name is, the computer doesn't understand. All it understands are the ones and zeros in the data table. So if every time the covariate is one, U is one, doesn't matter what the title is, and that's why marker is important. 
So now we can say, combine those sentences to say that a confounder must cause the outcome independently or be a marker for an independent cause of the outcome. That's what we just said. Those are the only two options if the covariate is associated with the outcome, but not caused by the outcome. If you come up with something else, please let me know, because as far as I know, that, those are the only choices. Now we also have that the covariate can't be affected by exposure. And it can't be a marker for a variable affected by exposure. Well, if that's the case and the covariate and the exposure are associated, then the covariate can cause the exposure that would create the association. Or there could be something else that causes the exposure and the covariate is a marker for that cause. Ian, yep. may, I, may I jump in? I have, I have a very, very basic question mm -hmm. that uh, I've been wondering about for some time. Mm -hmm. This seems very intuitive, but is there a mathematical definition of, of cause? Ah. So this is a philosophical debate that's been going on for, I think, uh, 400 years. <laughs> um, and the problem is, so the, Miguel Hernan gave a really good session. Well, he gave a, a, a it was a really good session uh, a few years ago at the European causal meeting, uh, going through some of the philosophy. The problem is that to define a cause is circular because in order to define the cause, you have to say it affects, a, a, a causes B if changing A changes B. But when I say change, I'm actually saying cause. And so the words become circular. I'm not a philosopher. Uh, so I, th that's about the best I can do. When we think about cause, we are saying, if I make a change in A, that changes B. That's the definition, practical definition of our cause. Mathematically, you would say that the distribution of B is a, it changes when you change the distribution of A. So that would be the mathematical definition. So basically distributions. Okay, thank you. Pearl, all of the stuff that we're talking about here where we talk about causal diagrams, all of this are based on mathematical models and assumptions. We're not gonna get into the really nitty gritty details of that. Certainly happy to talk with anybody offline because it gets very complicated very quickly. And there are very few people, even in causal inference, who really understand those differences. I'll give you an example. Pearl has the, the mathematical, the diagrams that we, that we show are just graphical diagrams illustrating assumptions. When you wanna use these to determine about if you're getting a true causal effect or not, an unbiased effect, you have to have a mathematical model under it. Pearl uses something called the non-parametric structural equation model, uh, which has a particular assumptions um, that he, he adds even assumptions to that. And Jamie Robbins has a model that has a few less assumptions and it's called the finest, the fully finest randomized causal interpreted structural tree graph model. Uh, and so those are different underlying mathematical models to the same causal diagram. And that affects how you can interpret from the model. Everything we're gonna talk about today and I show you is really based on Pearl stuff um, because that's the, that's the easiest way to think about it. He has one additional assumption that is, I think is uncommon to be violated. It's rarely violated. Uh, Jamie Robbins likes to make as few assumptions as possible. So he doesn't even want to make that. And so he, he uses some slightly different approaches. Uh, for the most part, the answers are the same except for specific uh, types of mediation questions. So let's go on here. Um, so we have the exposure now, like the outcome. We said the covariate had to cause the outcome or be a marker for a cause of the outcome. Now we have, it must cause the exposure or be a marker for a cause of the exposure. That's it. So that's a confounder. So now let's talk about the diagrams. So this is a causal uh, diagram if we believe that these arrows are causes. And we're in the second half, we're gonna come back to some more mathematical 
relations. What does this arrow actually mean mathematically? We'll come back to that later, okay, in the second half, because you don't need to understand that to actually know how to use it. We're going to redraw this <clears throat> from left to right. This is something for two reasons. One, this takes up less space than this. So here we have the covariate causing the exposure, covariate causing the exposure, covariate causing the outcome, covariate causing the outcome, exposure causing the outcome, exposure causing the outcome. It takes up less space. The other thing is in this diagram, we go from left to right so that anything that is, because uh, A can only cause B if A occurs before B, except in quantum mechanics, but A, so A has to occur before B, some people find it easier to order them from left to right in terms of time that they're measured. Uh, not everybody does this. And then later on, I'll show you one in which that's not, like we're gonna go through an example where Pearl used one and he never did that before. But this is something that is becoming more common and will probably be a recommendation for drawing causal diagrams in the future, just as we try and standardize the way people do things. We call this a directed acyclic graph. Why? Because each of these arrows are directed. They have a tail and an arrowhead. They're not bidirectional arrows, okay? Tail and an arrowhead. They're called acyclic because there's no variable that causes one variable and that other variable causes back. So we don't have an arrow from C to X and an arrow from X to C. That would be a non acyclic that would be a cyclic graph, directed cyclic graph. Now you can have causal cyclic graphs and because there's a lot of different types of causal diagrams. We're just showing you causal directed acyclic graphs today because these are the ones that are the most common and that most of the rules come from for about determining um, whether you get an unbiased effect. But there are other ones and there are advantages and disadvantages to each type. So here's our question is in this case, is this a confounder? Well, we're gonna go through the examples, but each time I want you to think about this sentence. Does the covariate cause the outcome or a marker for a cause of the outcome? If that is not true, it is not a confounder. If the second sentence is not true, it is not a confounder. So here, C causes the outcome. There's the arrow, it's a cause of the outcome. So the first sentence is true. C causes the exposure. So the second sentence is true. And we put a happy face. Now I want you to think about this one. So I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to think about this. And then I'm going to ask people. So I don't see raised hands. Dave, can they raise their hands in this uh, version? Uh, my understanding is that they should be. So if you go into the, let's see here, more. Maybe yeah. More. So if you go into the participants and click more, there's uh um, sort of a hand raising function there. Clap. Well, I guess it's, I have clap on mine. I don't know if you don't have the. No, I don't. I don't have that. All right. I was just curious to get people to vote. But as long as everybody's vote thought about it themselves, uh, I was. I'm curious to see how many people uh, would have said not. So the question is: Is this a confounder or not? So let's look at this. Normally, in a face to face, I ask people and say how many people think this or that. So here we have the first thing, does the covariate cause the outcome? Well, we don't have the covariate causing the outcome directly. There's no arrow from C to outcome in any way, but we do have this U and U is a cause of the outcome. Now the question then, if, you, if it's not a cause of the outcome, is it a marker for a cause of, the, of U? Well, because U causes C, C is a marker for U. Remember, a marker just means it's associated and we don't care what the direction is. So in this case, U causes C, therefore C is a marker for U. It may be a good marker, it may be a terrible marker, but it's a marker. So because it's a marker for U 
and u is a cause of the outcome, it satisfies the first sentence. C is a cause of the exposure. So it satisfies the second sentence. So it's a confounder. And we would want to adjust for it. When we go here, think about this. So let's see, is C a cause of the outcome? Yes, C, there's an arrow straight to the outcome. Now is C cause the exposure? No, there's no arrow from C to exposure, but there is an arrow from U to C and U is a cause of the exposure. So if U is a cause of the exposure and U causes C, then C is a marker for U. So now we have, that it is not a cause of the exposure, but a marker for the cause of the exposure. And therefore it's a confounder and we would adjust for C. What about this one? So Ian, while you're considering, or people are considering that, there's a question in the chat. If, uh... Okay. For you. Great time is on the main menu. I don't see it on mine, okay. but um, uh, if any variables it, connected by arrows are markers, when is something not a marker for another variable in a DAG? If any variables connected by arrows are markers, when is something not a marker for a variable on a DAG? So we'll come back to that in, in a sec. Uh, as we get to more complicated things, you'll see that. But not all variables are markers for other variables. Just these are toy examples at this point. So let's look here. We look and we say, in this case, we don't want to do it for two reasons. First, C lies along the causal pathway. So remember, if something lies along the causal pathway, it's not uh, it's not something that we want to control for. So here we have the exposed, but besides that, remember C is supposed to be a cause of the exposure. So here C is a cause of the outcome, but it's not a cause of the exposure. And it is not a marker for a cause of the exposure. So in actual fact, this is an example where it's not a marker for a cause of the exposure. It's a marker for the exposure, not for a cause of the exposure in this example. So C is not a cause of the exposure and it's not a marker for a cause of the exposure. Therefore, it's not a confounder. What about this one? This is actually the example that got me really interested in causal inference. Um, it was published in 1993 by Clarice Weinberg. And uh, before causal, she drew a causal diagram before anybody knew about them just out of the top of her head, um, which was fascinating. Uh, and this is super important. So if we go through our two sentences, is C a cause of the outcome? No, there's no arrow from C to the outcome. Is C a marker for a cause of the outcome. Well, U is a cause of the outcome. U causes C, therefore C is a marker for U. So it satisfies the first one. Is C a cause of the exposure? No. Is it a marker for a cause of the exposure? No, we have no causes of exposure in this toy example. Again, this is where it's not a marker. It is a marker for U, which is an effective exposure, but that's not the cause of the exposure. So in this case, C is not a confounder and we would not want to adjust for it. Now it's more than that though, because if you put in C here, the same thing here, if you adjust for something that lies along the causal pathway, you're actually removing part of the effect in here. So if you run a regression, you can simulate data fairly easily here. And this is the whole thing about direct effects. If I actually simulated data here and I threw in C, 
I would have no effect of exposure on the outcome independent of C, right? But we're interested in the total effect of exposure. So why do we want to remove the effect of exposure that's working through C if we're looking for the total effect. We want to decompose it into direct and indirect effects. That's a different question than whether we're interested in the effect of the exposure. Now, in this case, it's different because you're not actually uh, adjusting for anything along the causal path. Remember, exposure causes you, you causes the outcome. That is a causal path from exposure to outcome. Here, we're adjusting for a variable that lies along the causal path, for a marker of a variable that lies along the causal pathway. Now, you might think that if I adjust for C, I remove all of the effect of exposure, that in this case also, I would just always bias towards the null. That is not true. And Clarice Weinberg's paper, which was on spontaneous abortion in pregnancy, shows three mathematical examples using the, she simulates data with different distributions and shows that in fact, when you put in C, sometimes you can get a bias towards the null, away from the null and even reverse the effect. So you complete, you want to know the total effect of exposure and outcome. And when you adjust for C, you have no idea what you're getting in the end because you're adjusting for a marker for a variable that lies along the causal pathway. In sport medicine, and I think in sport analytics, this is also very common in what we call competing events. So think that outcome might be knee injuries and this, other outcome might be ankle injuries. So I'm interested in knee injuries over the course of a season and someone gets an ankle fracture halfway through the season and leaves the team. If I only, anal if I say, well, that person, I'm not going, I'm, I'm gonna restrict them because they didn't finish the season. I am actually conditioning on ankle fracture. I'm saying I'm looking only at those people who don't have an ankle fracture. And once I do that, I'm getting a biased estimate for the total effect of my intervention or exposure. So this is a competing risk problem. And the way we analyze completing, competing risks in epidemiology has traditionally been very, very poor. Uh, even now, there are some methods that um, are quite complicated. Uh, and we have, to, there's the Nelson, Nelson Allen estimator, which is the one that's sort of um, used often now, but even that has some important limitations and important assumptions. And now more recently, there's some other methods that have come about that are being promoted and developed and, and evaluated and stuff. But this is a competing risk problem. And if all you do is censor people when they have the competing outcome, you're likely getting a biased effect unless some very particular assumptions hold, which are unlikely. Now, what about this example? So notice here, I don't go from left to right in the arrows, okay? But this is just a... So when I gave this talk to an infectious disease group, the guy, the, the head prof, very smart guy, uh, when I asked them, he said, oh, that one uh, I wouldn't adjust for. And I said, why not? And he said, well, because on the first slide, you showed three happy faces. And on this slide, you have two sad faces. So I'm guessing this is another sad face. And he was right. But the reason is here we have is C a cause of the outcome? No, there's no arrow from C to outcome. U is a cause of the outcome. C is a marker for U. So first sentence is okay. Second sentence, must cause the exposure. It doesn't cause the exposure. There are no causes of exposure here. Say it's a randomized trial. Uh, and so it's not actually a confounder and we wouldn't adjust for it. Now, in this case, let me just show you what we showed on the last slide. 
This was the structure of the causal diagram in the previous slide, in this one. They look very similar. In fact, the only difference is the direction of this arrow. So in both cases, the associations are exactly the same. Mathematically, if you did the associations, you could simulate data these two different ways and have the exact same association between the covariate and the exposure, but the direction of the causation is different. In this one, we adjust. In this one, we don't. You cannot do statistics for causal effects unless you know the direction of these causal relationships. Now, you might not know them, but you have to make certain assumptions about them. And if you're wrong about the assumptions, then your whole analytical strategy will be flawed. And so what we do often when we don't know is we say, there's not one possible causal DAG, there might be three or four. And if there are three or four, and we don't know which one is true, then we just don't know which is the proper analytical strategy unless there is one analytical strategy that satisfies all of them. And if we don't know, we don't know and we have to be honest about that. Because otherwise, we're just talking about associations. And I'll start back at the beginning. You may be treating people uh, to prevent fractures by giving them uh, hair color, uh, dye to color their hair. That's essentially what you would be doing in this particular case, okay? You would be treating something and not getting any effect because you have the wrong, your assumptions are wrong about it or you're not willing to explicitly state your assumptions. So, and then what you'd say is, well, I don't know which one of these, but then you say, I, let's be transparent. I don't know. And so what we're gonna do in the future is we're gonna wait and other people will develop more studies. We'll get some basic scientists to do some stuff. And then we'll learn about those causal relationships. And then we'll know which of the appropriate analytical strategies is correct. Or we run a randomized trial. I mean, there's other ways we can run new studies. So now I want to go into this one. And I want you to spend a few minutes on this one. Well, 20 seconds. So Ian, there's a question. Great point. Yep. Ian. But do we ever truly know what the right DAG is? Well, um, do we ever know the truth? We're hopefully not, because if we did, we'd all be out of work, right? Um, so we're always trying to find out more. The issue is that when you're trying to estimate an effect, you have to make assumptions. And so we make those assumptions, and sometimes we're very sure about those assumptions. So first of all, if A is associated with B, and B occurs after A, we know that B did not cause A because that's just not possible. So we know then that either A is a cause of B, there's, or A is a marker for a cause of B, or uh, you know, something of that sort, that, or there's some common cause of A and B. So we can come up with different types of explanations for those associations, and sometimes we can eliminate some of those associations. To the extent that we don't know and we're unsure, that's what we're going to go through later. And that's why you would draw different causal diagrams. All right, so let's look at this one now. C must cause the outcome or be a marker for a cause of the outcome. Well, it there's no arrow from C to outcome, but you, excuse me, you too is a cause of the outcome. And C is a marker for U2. So it satisfies the first sentence. The second one, it's not a cause of the exposure, but U1 is a cause of the exposure. And C is a marker for U1. Let's say U1 and U2 are unmeasured variables. So now C actually satisfies both of these sentences. And because it satisfies both of these sentences, you might want to call it a confounder. But it is not. In traditional epidemiology, this satisfies all of the requirements for a confounder, but it is not, and you shouldn't adjust for it. So in causal inference, the definition of a confounder is actually not, there's no definition of a confounder. Uh, we'll talk about confounding paths, 
Okay, so people will say a confounder is something that causes both the exposure and the outcome, and that's true. But there are other things that you should adjust for to block confounding bias that don't satisfy that uh, situation, and we'll talk about that shortly. So what's going on here, and why shouldn't you adjust for this? This is called a collider, and this is the important difference between traditional epidemiology and causal inference. To understand what a, the importance of the collider, this, um, this actually comes from Pearl's the causality book. We explain it in a paper that we wrote to explain his appendix and stuff, but let's think about this. We have different seasons of the year, and in the spring, it rains. And also, it's not always raining, so we have automatic sprinklers that will go on to make sure that the grass is, is kept wet and healthy. Now, sprinklers and rain both cause the grass to be wet, and if the, if the grass is wet, then it's slippery, you might fall. So what's a collider? Well, here we have two arrowheads that collide on the variable, which is why we call it a collider. If you know the value of the collider, then the parents, the two va the variables that cause the collider become associated. What does that mean? Well, if I tell you that the field is wet and it did not rain, everybody's going to say, I hope everybody's going to say, well, it is extremely likely that the sprinkler was on. Yes, it's possible that a whole bunch of dogs came and pissed all over the lawn, and that's why it's wet, but it is highly probable that the sprinkler was on. In other words, if you know the value of the collider, then having information about one of the parents provides information about another of the parents. So if I knew it didn't rain, I have information about whether the sprinkler was likely to be on. Now, it's not true in all levels. So if I told you it did rain, you have no idea if the sprinklers were on or not. And if I told you that the sprinklers went on and the field was wet, you wouldn't know if it rained. But if I told you that the sprinklers had gone on and the field was still dry, you'd know that it hadn't rained. So it only has to be associated in certain levels. So here we have wet, and I, if it's wet, and it did not rain, I know the sprinklers were on, therefore rain and sprinklers are associated by the definition, the mathematical definition of association. So that's why collider is important because it creates these non-causal associations. There's no, sprinklers don't cause rain and rain don't cause automatic sprinklers. There's no causation between these two. That's a non-causal association. So when we, so we know the value of collider, we create non-causal associations between the parents. For those who are more interested in math, we have x2, x3, x4. If I tell you that x4 is a function of x2, and x4 is equal to x2 plus x3, and I tell you x4 is 10, you don't know what x2 and x3 are. You have no idea, right? That could be anything, 9.1, 0.9, whatever. But if I tell you x2 is 7, you now know what x3 is. So I tell you x4 is 10 then you now have some information, you now know, uh, then X2 and X3 become associated because having information about one gives you information about the other. Definition of association. So in this case, because this collider, if we condition on it, we create a non-causal association between U1 and U2, I'm now putting this arrow, we now see that there's a causal association between U1 and E, a non-causal association between U1 and U2, and a causal association from U2 to outcome. Now I'm gonna get away from the words causation and just use the word association. If E is associated with U1 and U1 is associated with U2, then E is associated with U2. And if U2 is associated with outcome, then E is associated with the outcome. And one of those associations is non-causal. Therefore, this association between E and outcome is a non-causal association. We're only interested in estimating the causal effects of the out exposure on the outcome. So if we include that collider, we are now in our estimate 
including a non-causal association. And that's why we say it's a biased estimate for the causal effect. Now, if you're interested in whether blonde hair causes fractures, fine, that's what you would be assessing. But I'm interested in the causal effects. And so it's very important about the differences. It, in sport analytics, you're often interested in prediction instead of causation. Uh, in medicine, uh, we're interested in prediction. If you have cancer, you want to know, do you have one year to live or five years to live? And that's important because it helps plan. But that's not a causal question. That's a predictive question. I'm not trying. I'm going to do things. I'm going to prepare my will. I don't think that's going to change my how long I have to live. But there are actions that I have to take. In sport, in sport medicine, we are interested in um, predicting the number of people we have to treat because we have to order tape and padding and ice and we have and pills. And so we have to manage our resources. And managing resources is a predictive question, not a causal question. But if I want to know if I institute this prevention program, will I reduce the number of injuries? That's a causal question. If I want to know if the crossovers will increase my chance of scoring, that's a causal question. And so we have to say that this is important when you're interested in causal questions. The other difference for prediction is really if you're thinking about Prediction is about the universe continuing with no changes. So when I use any statistical model for prediction, I'm saying I'm interested in what's in predicting the future if the universe stays exactly the same as it is today. That's what prediction is about. If I'm going to change the universe by putting in an intervention, then my prediction will no longer hold because now I'm trying to predict in a new world. I've changed the world. So if I predicted based on the old world and I've changed the world, then why should my prediction still hold? So you have to think about predictive questions and uh, causal questions. There are some other nuances. Some people use predictive and descriptive differently, but, but that's essentially predictive and causal. Hey, Ian. Yep. I have a quick question about this, this diagram. So is the real problem here that C is a collider or is the real problem here that there is no causal uh, path from E to outcome? That is, if there were an arrow from E to outcome, would we want to adjust for C? Um, so the answer, so it's, the, the reason there's no arrow here is because it's easier to see things. Um, when, if there was an arrow from E to outcome, then the, and we conditioned on C, we would get a, a weighted average of the effect, the causal effect of the exposure on outcome and the non-causal association of this. So it would be a mixture of the two. And so if we don't have the arrow here, then, and we see an association, we know it's non-causal. So we tend to, when we try and teach this, we try to leave out these arrows because it's easier to see where there's an obvious biased path. So, but when there, you know, when there's like three paths and you're estimating the effect, you're estimating the effect across all of those paths. It's just a weighted average across them. Is that, does that help? Um, yeah, sort of, I, I'm. Okay. Let's say when, that when you said that the problem was with a collider, you mm -hmm. began you began to explain the problem with the collider by explaining that that left no causal path from E to the outcome. Right. But if there uh, was a causal path from E to the outcome, would the collider still be a problem? Yes. Okay. Because that's... yes, absolutely. Because what we're trying to say is that if there was a path here, right? This is the path that we're trying to estimate from exposure to outcome. So if that existed, we would be, our estimate would include this, and it would also include this non-causal association. Now, for instance, let's say this association is causal and the exposure reduces the outcome by half, but this non-causal association is that makes the exposure and outcome 
positively associated. So we have a negative association here and a positive association here, and they're exactly in opposite directions. Our estimate would be zero. We would estimate no causal effect, even though the exposure actually does affect the outcome. So it's just an average of all causal paths. When you, your statistics is an average of all, sorry, an average of all associations, the statistics, we're only interested in the causal associations. So if we include the non-causal, we're getting a biased estimate for what we actually want. Okay, so, so including the collider in, in the adjustment then would effectively be adding the additional dotted path. Exactly. And so if we don't want that added dotted path in our, in our analysis, we should leave out the collider. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. And we're going to go through that example. So let's go through some examples of where this occurs. In medicine, I don't think you'd have it so much in sport analytics because you don't do case control studies, but you could in sport analytics if you wanted to. In fact, we're, we're thinking about using that approach for a particular question we have in sport analytics. Um, but here, if you think about, people talk about estrogen as a preventing uh, bone fractures. And so you might, you know, if you're gonna see, where are you gonna get your fractures? Where you're gonna recruit the patients from the emergency room. Um, and so if you wanna make sure that you get the same type of population, same socioeconomic status, you wanna control for all these variables that might create non-causal association. Say, well, I'm going to take people from the, if, they, if other people went to the emergency room, then they're probably from the same socioeconomic region. And so that's a way I'm going to adjust for them. The problem is that myocardial infarction also will cause people to go to the emergency room. So those who aren't in medicine, that's a heart attack, okay? So now look, Emergency room is a collider for fracture and myocardial infarction. So that creates a non-causal association between fracture and myocardial infarction. Now, if we actually did this study, a case control study on eMERGE, and we were interested in the effects of estrogen on heart attacks, we would see a non-causal association between estrogen and heart attacks. In other words, we would come out with an odds ratio saying, oh, estrogen increases your risk of heart attack or decreases your risk of heart attack, depending on the, the, the associations that we have here. So that, and that would be non-causal. And this was a big problem in epidemiology. And in epidemiology, we call this Berkson's bias. So in the textbooks, it's all in there not to do this. They call it Berkson's bias. From a causal inference, this is a collider stratification problem because we are conditioning on emergency. Now, notice I didn't put emergency room in the statistical model, but conditioning on a variable is if you put it in the model or you restrict your population to a particular subgroup. So everybody who's gotten estrogen could have, some will have gone to the emergency, some not. I'm only examining people who went to the emergency room. So I'm restricting the population to one level of that variable, because this is emergency, yes or no. And we're only picking yes. That is the equivalent of putting the variable in a statistical model. And so that's called conditioning on the variable. So we're not allowed to, we, we can't do that. If we do that here, we set up this non-causal association and that'll give us a biased estimate. Now, this is a cohort study. We're gonna come and draw this. This was actually an analysis done by some people in, in Qatar uh, and they presented it at an international meeting in 2015. And so I use this as an example of how you shouldn't do this. So they were interested in, in risk factors for subsequent hamstring injury after a first hamstring injury. And what they did, so everybody had to have a first injury to have a second injury. And they went and they measured hamstring weakness or strength after the injury. So after rehab, right? People had the rehab and then they measured their strength after rehab. And they found that the people who were stronger after rehab actually had a higher risk of injury than people who were weaker after rehab. 
And in the talk, um, we just published, uh, we have something on Sport Archive on this because I was upset that a bunch of people still are thinking this way. So we just published this in Sport Archive and it's under review somewhere. Um, but the idea here is that this is a collider stratification problem that they're seeing. We know from lots of studies that if you have weak hamstrings, you're more at risk of having a hamstring injury than if you have strong hamstrings. There's been a number of studies on that before. Uh, and there's no collider problem there. So what's happening here? The first hamstring injury, when you have your hamstring, that causes some weakness. And we're gonna say that my hypothesis is that this weakness actually causes the second hamstring injury. But I also know if you have weak hamstrings at baseline, you're likely to have weaker hamstrings after injury. So you take two people, one with strong, one with weak hamstrings, they both get injured. After the injury and after the rehab, the person who had strong initially is likely to have stronger hamstrings after. That's okay. Now you also have, sorry, this is in my way. Um, you also have other factors that can cause hamstring injury. Strikers are more likely to have a hamstring injury because they're sprinting a lot than goalies. Uh, style of play, if you're more aggressive, it might be flexibility. There could be a whole bunch of things, just your inherent tissue strength. Some people might have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome where the, the connective tissue is deficient in some way. So there's a lot of reasons, other reasons why you could have hamstring injury besides just your strength. So what's happening in the collider? Here we have a collider. And uh, in fact, this is also a collider here. Now, this collider actually does not affect our analysis because we already have an association here between hamstring weakness and hamstring injury. But this collider here between hamstring weakness and other factors causing the first injury, remember we're only looking at people with first injury, so we're conditioning on this variable. It's a collider. We create a non-causal association between this and this. Now think about it just intuitively. If you got, if you had a ha strong hamstrings and you got injured your hamstrings, the reason had to be something else here. So if I know that you got injured and you had strong hamstrings, then you're very likely to be a striker or have some connective tissue disorder or something else. So these two become inversely associated. Right? Well, depending on how I code them, could be positive or inversely. But basically, these two become associated. That if I have a hamstring injury and I don't have one, then I'm very likely to have the other. That's the definition of association. So now we have a non we have a causal association here, non-causal association here, causal association here, and then we have a hamstring weakness is associated here therefore associated here, therefore associated here, and there's a non-causal association within that link. Therefore, it's a non-causal association that would be estimated. Coming back to the question before, in this case, we do have the arrow from weakness to hamstring injury. So the question is, in fact, I'm, I'm hypothesizing that this hamstring weakness will cause the second hamstring. In the analysis that was done on real data, they got the opposite effect. In other words, this non-causal association was likely much stronger than the causal association. So the non-causal association suggested weakness was protective. The causal association is that weakness causes the hamstring injury because the non-causal association is stronger. That takes precedent and the estimate would be one of, uh, would suggest that you're better off being weak. And you know, this has incredibly important um, uh, in implications for rehabilitation. And in the talk, what the guy said, and he's a friend of mine, but what he said was, you know, if you think about this, you tore your hamstring, there's a weak link. If you have strong hamstrings, that's now gonna pull on the weak link and therefore you're more likely to get injured. The problem is, although that could make some physiological sense, I could 
make the arguments of why that's not true. I'm not going to do that now. But the problem is the analysis doesn't tell you that. So the analysis was flawed because we expect the results even if what he said was not true. Now, in an analysis, how can we adjust for that? Oh, by the way, I wrote second hamstring injury, but you could have just said scoring opportunities or goals or assists or whatever else you want. It would be the exact same analysis. Um, we're going to get back, come back later um, to this. How, this is, ooh, okay, so I'm going much slower than I thought. Uh, we're not going to go through this. Okay, Pearl's rules. So this is a complex diagram with a lot of causal structures, and I don't want to suggest that all of these arrows are exactly what I, that I believe in all of them. What happened in this paper, this is Pearl's book from his appendix, he didn't put any words in here. He just had nodes. Um, I added words. We wrote a paper to explain how this works. And we, we were asked to like give make it so with uh, real variables. And so I just made this up. I think it makes sense. Uh, but I, don't, I think there are other possibilities before. People are saying, do we ever know the causal map? And in some textbooks and chapters, I've written, oh, maybe we don't know that. Maybe there's a couple of arrows here. And how would that change our inferences? So exactly the questions that you asked before were great. And we're coming to them now. You'll see here also, this doesn't move from left to right. And it's an older diagram. So the question is, which measurements should be included in the model if we're interested in the relation between X and the outcome? Warm-up exercises do warm-up exercises, prevent injuries. And let's say we've this is what we think, but we want to run the study and we don't want to measure everything. Or maybe some things are better measured than others. Do we have to adjust for all of these variables? Now, it is true that by traditional epidemiology, every single one of these variables is associated with the exposure, associated with the outcome, and do not lie along the causal pathway except for this one. Therefore, they, they actually fulfill all of the criteria for traditional epidemiology. And if you were doing that, you would have to include all of these variables because that's what they do. So you could do stepwise regression because say, well, now that I've included that one, this one's not important. But we're going to say, what if we just include these two variables? What would happen? So Pearl has some rules. He says that the variables that we pick, we're going to call them Z1 and Z2, they shouldn't be descendants of the exposure. Well, they're not here. The exposure doesn't cause these. We should delete all non-ancestors. So everything that's not a cause of X. So now look, coach causes motivation, causes warm-up exercises. Fitness causes pregame, causes warm-up. So even though these aren't immediately direct causes, they are causes of the exposure. The only non-cause of exposure in this diagram is previous injury. So we remove it. Delete all arcs emanating from X. There's only one, we take it away. We connect any two parents sharing a common child. So these are the colliders. The common child is a collider. Fitness level has two parents, so we join them. Uh, Z1 has two parents, so we join it. Y has tissue weakness and neuromuscular fatigue, so we join it. So we join them all. Now we take all the arrowheads. Even though we worked so hard and I told you those arrowheads are important, now we take them away. We delete all lines into and out of Z1 and Z2. If there is no line from X to outcome, then we call that de-separation. It's, de it's, it's for directed. There's no directed. Uh, the directed arrows are separated now. So there is no confounding. And that's how we know. So this is the logic of the algorithm. Now, it's going to get easier because there's computer programs that'll do all this for you. And we're gonna go through that in the next, uh, after a break. So, but why does this work? Well, Z1 and Z2 shouldn't be descendants of X. And that's because we said covariates should not be affected by X. So that's super important. If you adjust for a variable that is an effect of the exposure, you are immediately getting a biased estimate. So you have to make sure that that doesn't occur. It didn't occur here. Delete all non-ancestors of X. Um, basically, what that means is that all variables that are left are either conditioned on or have one of their descendants conditioned on. 
that's important. Delete all arcs emanating from X. Well, we want to delete that because we're interested in estimating the effect of exposure. So we want the total causal effect. So in this particular algorithm, we're trying to determine if our estimate of the total effect is biased by non-causal pathways. Since any arrow coming out of X is measuring a causal pathway, we're not interested in identifying the causal pathways at this point. This is an exercise in identifying non-causal pathways. So we remove it because it's a causal pathway. Connect any two parents sharing a common child. This is the key. It has to do with the colliders. And it's the colliders. If you condition on a collider or a descendant on the collider, it opens up this non-causal pathway. And that's why we put in these arrows, these, these lines, because we're now indicating all the non-causal associations that actually exist in our analysis. Now we strip all the arrowheads, although we worked really hard for them. The reason is we needed those arrowheads to determine these non-causal associations that we've added. Now that we've added them, we no longer need the arrows. So it just simplifies the diagram. Delete all lines emanating from Z1 and Z2. So for those of you who use Baron and Kelly's thing for direct and direct effects, you know that if you condition on a variable that lies along a pathway, you are eliminating the association through that pathway and only looking at associations that are independent. We are conditioning on neuromuscular fatigue and tissue weakness, that's our model. Therefore, we are looking for non-causal pathways that are independent of those variables. So we remove them. Now we've actually, because we use those arrowheads, we've actually added to the diagram, not only the causal associations, but also the non-causal associations. And so now we can evaluate if there's any non-causal association between the exposure and the outcome. And we don't see any connection. So in other words, if X is disconnected from the outcome, there is no confounding or there is no remaining covariate that is a cause or a marker for a cause of X and a cause or a marker for a cause of the outcome. In other words, we can now go back to the traditional reasoning of epidemiology or in statistics is just that we now no longer have this common cause of X and outcome. And so we don't have any non-causal associations. And we feel confident then that any association we do have between the exposure and outcome is actually a causal association. Now to go through this last part uh, fairly quickly, if we had adjusted for previous injury, which a lot of people do all the time, and I'm not saying it's always wrong to do, but if this was your map and you adjusted for the previous injury, what happens? Well, we delete all non-ancestors. Before we deleted previous injury, now we don't because we're conditioning on it. We delete the X, the X, we connect any two parents. Now we have this pink arrow because this is a collider. So now we have, because it's a collider, team motivation and contact sport become associated non-causally. We just walk through the other steps. Unfortunately, we now have X being connected to the outcome. So by if this were the truth, by conditioning on the previous injury, we have introduced bias than if we had not. And if you use traditional epidemiology where you say, oh, I'm going, or traditional statistics, uh, when I, is this previous injury associated with exposure? Yes, it's associated with the outcome, yes. When you put it in the model, it changes the effect estimate. Oh, I better adjust for it. No, that is the faulty reasoning. The faulty reasoning is not understanding that when you actually add variables, you may be introducing bias instead of reducing it. It is not a bias variance trade-off, which is what most people think. Oh, if I put in an extra variable, I might get increased variance, but I'm reducing bias. This is not about that. This is actually increasing variance and increasing bias. Uh, we have different names for it, but uh, now, generally speaking, people are calling it collider stratification bias. So this is called the structural approach to bias. Uh, we have confounding bias, which is failure to condition on a common cause. 
colitis stratification bias. It used to be called selection bias. Some people still do. We don't like selection bias so much because it's used, uh, it, it has other meanings. Some people use it to mean other things. Sometimes it's used to mean confounding bias. Sometimes it's used to mean some other issues. So a lot of us just use colitis stratification now, which conditioning on a common effect, creating a non-causal association. Over-adjustment bias is when you're uh, conditioning on something that's an effect of the exposure. Now, if you think about this map, there are only two true, uh, there's a few true confounders. Coach is a cause of the exposure and a cause of the outcome. Fitness level is a cause of the exposure and a cause of the outcome. Genetics is a cause of exposure and a cause of the outcome. But none of these other variables are. Pre-game is a cause of the exposure. It is a marker for a cause of, fit, of something of the outcome, but it's not a common cause. So pregame is a marker. So some people use the term uh, confounders to say it must be a cause of both exposure and outcome. It's not exactly true. And I showed you that if you condition on neuromuscular fatigue and tissue weakness, you end up with an unbiased effect estimate. But are these then not confounders anymore? Well, they are confounders. So I think. What's going to happen in 20 years? Oh, you said that 10 years ago. Now I'm saying I added another. I said 20 years, 10 years ago. I'm still saying 20 years. That really what you have to think about are confounding pathways or non causal pathways. So we have lots of non causal pathways here. And we're going to talk about that more in the second, in the next section. Um, but with those non causal pathways, we want to block them. And so there are many ways of blocking different causal pathways. And what we term as a confounder is really what we're saying is, does this variable block a non-causal pathway that is open? And if it does, we're going to call that a confounder and something we should adjust for. Notice that there are different ways. So I could have done neuromuscular fatigue and tissue weakness. We'll come to later on other ways. And then if there are different ways of adjusting, which one should you do? And we'll, we'll talk about that in the next section. Okay. Um, so that's conditioning our pathway. Uh, determine, this is okay. Remember, it must cause the exposure or marker for cause, independently cause the outcome, and does not open up any backdoor pathways. But even then, you don't want to adjust for all those variables. And so we have model selection uh, processes and we have some good software to easy to use software that'll help you decide which ones to do. So that took me um, 10 minutes longer than I had hoped. Let's take a five minute break, okay? Just to give everybody a chance to catch up uh, and then we'll come back. Dave, I'm, I'm happy to talk for longer. Um, it's hard because I can't read the audience and I know from some of the questions that they were at a level that I just felt I should go through this in more detail. And even then I felt I sped up much more than I wanted to. Sure. Um, yeah. So if people want to stay longer, I know it's supposed to be two hours. I'm happy to stay longer um, and we'll see how the next part goes. Please yeah. ask your questions. I'll try and answer them at the beginning of the next uh, session. And since we're recording it, I mean, if people need to come back to it, then they can do that. If yeah. Early. And emails are fine. I'm happy to answer any emails and stuff too. Okay. All right. Perfect. So let's take five minutes. And I'm setting my timer so I don't forget because I usually do. And uh, we'll see you in a bit. Okay. Great. Thanks, Ian. I'm just okay. going to pause the recording now. Chat. Okay. So no new questions in the chat. I hope that means that things were clear and not that people are giving up. Um, so uh, Ian, I can ask sort of a question or... I'd be interested at some point if you could um, uh, talk about uh, like time series and temporal information and, you know, the idea that effects come after causes. If right. That fits. Um... Yeah. So that is what I was trying to say before that A, if you have A and B and B comes after A, B cannot cause A. Mm. Right. Unless you're in quantum mechanics when it can, but we're not in quantum mechanic world. So the the resident in terms of 
when we go to time series, and we can talk about that now. Well, we'll talk about it in the hamstring example. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to come, come I'll, I'll do that when I draw the diagram in a second, because it's actually important uh, how we think about variables and acyclic stuff. So this is what we've talked about before, um, just as confounding bias, failure, com common cause, condition, common effect, and conditioning on causal pathway or biases. Um, I gave you the example of a hamstring injury, and these aren't the people who, this, this isn't the same presentation. This is a paper that was published in 2020. Recalibrating the risk of hamstring injury, a 2020 systematic review meta-analysis of risk factors for index and recurrent hamstring strain injury. And in the conclusion of this systematic review and meta-analysis is older age and the history of a hamstring injury are the strongest risk factors for hamstring injury uh, uh, injury. So future direction uh, may be directed towards exploring interaction of risk factors. Now, most people would take this to mean that the first hamstring actually causes the second hamstring injury. In fact, people will say, people at the conference in 2015, there were two presenters, the one I quoted and another person who said, the first after a first hamstring, after a first injury, your risk of a second injury is two to 19 times higher than somebody who didn't have an injury. And they said, either there is permanent damage or we are not doing a good job at rehabilitation. So they made direct inference from those results like this meta-analysis to say that we are not rehabbing people appropriately. And that is the incorrect inference. All right, and I'm going to show you actual data for this. This is a paper that we published in 2008, I think, um, <clears throat> in the 2011. And this is Cirque du Soleil data. And these are, this is a survival graph. So we have percent of individuals without a second injury, without an injury, sort of. And here are an athlete exposure is every single time they performed in a show. And here what we have is the time to first injury, okay? So we have, as, as we go through 500, we, when we have like uh, 100 uh, uh, games, we'd have like only 40% injured. And then when you get to 500 so performances, we have 80% had an injury, okay? Then when we go out, we look at those who had a first injury and what's their time to second injury? we see that we get a higher percentage of people getting injury. The survival time is less for the second injury, and again for the third, and again for the fourth, and again for the fifth. So as we go from first to second to third, we are getting injured faster and faster. This is the data that the people are citing when they say that hamstring injury is a predictor of a subsequent injury. And I completely agree. This is the data that shows that. The problem is that that doesn't mean that you have not rehabbed properly at all, because this is a mathematical certainty uh, in almost every single case. I, should, uh, I would say it's mathematical certainty in every case, the way the data is. If you were actually increasing the risk, then what we would expect is that somebody who had three injuries would have a, uh, their second injury faster than their first and their third injury faster than their second. So this takes everybody with three or more injuries and only looks at their time, the first, second, and third injury. And you see that the lines basically superimpose. In other words, they are not speeding up. So why do these two graphs differ? Well, because they're different people in this graph. Think about the people who didn't have a first injury. Let's say we take in American football or Canadian football, we take field goal kickers. Well, field goal kickers are unlikely to get injured because they're rarely on the field. And when they are, they're not allowed to be touched, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say when we take the time to first injury, 
we are including field goal kickers who are only going to get injured way out here. But when we look at time to second injury, a lot of those field goal kickers would never have been injured. So although they count in this graph because we censor them at follow-up, they do not count in this graph. In other words, this graph removes all of the people who are at the lowest risk of injury. So if I have a group of people with heterogeneous injury risks and I remove everybody who had the lowest injury risk, then obviously my injury risk is gonna go up. And then when I go from second to third, I'm removing everybody, again, amongst all those with the second injury, I'm removing everybody with the lowest risk of injury. So again, the risk is gonna go up. These are predictive because each is a subset population of the next one. So it's a truism to say. So if you analyze this data, it might be that you haven't rehabbed, but you don't know because you have these non-causal associations between these groups. You're just basically subsetting groups and they're different populations. So let's go to this program called Daggety. So Daggety is written by Johannes Texter and there's a there's an R version and a web version. In the web version, you can download to your own um, computer. Oh, that's, that's too bad. So let me do this. Uh, I thought that link, that link should have worked, but so I've got this version on my um, computer, just a slow computer. <clears throat> And if you go to the website, you could do this online, you could download it, it's the same thing. So this is the overall program and we can draw the diagram. I'm gonna show you in examples, I, uh, he actually used the paper that Robert Platt and I wrote in 2008, which is basically Pearl's thing. And, and if we just look at this for a second, there's a lot of colors, there's a lot of things going on, but I'm gonna start one from scratch you know, after we go through some of the concepts here. So we have an exposure here. It's noted by an, a green with an arrow. Here's the legend. We have the outcome, which is noted by an eye within a blue circle. Anything that's an ancestor of the exposure is in green. If you're an ancestor of both exposure and outcome, that's remember our confounders, causes. We have fitness, coach, and genetics. So those are in, in red. And if you're just an ancestor of the outcome, you're in blue. And if you're nothing, some other variable that's previous injury. So we went through that before. The key to this is this box up here for you. If you draw your causal diagram in this program, all you have to do is look up here to tell you which variables you have to adjust for to get an unbiased estimate. So we have, if I adjust for coach and fitness level, that's all I have to do. Coach and fit these two variables, I have an unbiased estimate. I don't have to worry about any other variable. If I adjust for another way I could do it is coach and pregame proprioception. So I could adjust for these two variables. I could do connective tissue disorder and neuromuscular fatigue, these two variables. Fitness level and genetics wherever those fitness level and genetics, these two variables. So I have multiple ways that I could obtain an unbiased estimate. Now, theoretically, if I had exact measures on every single one of these variables, then all of these should give me the same answer. Practically speaking, that's not going to occur for a variety of reasons. One, uh, theoretically, they would all do it, but in any given study, you're going to have some differences that occur by chance. So if things occur by chance, you're going to, it might be that fitness level is not completely associated, it's not a completely, uh, the, the distributions we get aren't exactly causal distributions just by chance. So we can get differences just by chance that way. The other thing is that these variables are measured with accuracy, to di with different degrees of accuracy. So it might be that I can measure connective tissue disorder very accurately, but fitness level not, or 
maybe pregame proprioception, I'm not going to be measuring every single person on their pregame proprioception and going into force plate analysis and uh, center of balance and center of mass and looking at all of that. No, I'm going to use, okay, how long can you stand on a pillow? Well, that's, that's one measure of pregame pro of proprioception, but it's not the most accurate measure. So we would want to choose the variables, one, that are the most accurate, and also cost. It might be that measuring neuromuscular fatigue using, I don't know, I, my PhD was in, started in fatigue. So you could use um, EMG and, gee, I can't remember the name, but when you generate the force and, and in, uh, twitch interpolation to see if there's fatigue. So, but that's expensive to do. And you're not gonna do that on everybody. So you might wanna pick certain variables over other variables for logistical reasons or cost reasons. Um, to the extent that you have this theoretical map and you do have different ways of, and you have data on different variables, then you can compare your results for those different variables. Um, and then you can see how consistent those results are with your theoretical causal framework. If they're very inconsistent, you might say, hmm, maybe my causal diagram isn't right and I should do it. That becomes a different field where, which is called causal discovery. Uh, we're not going to get into that, but trying to determine causal relationships from the data is a whole field and an art in itself. So now let's go to make a new model. Um, so I'm just going to go to a new model and it says, name my exposure variable. So if you remember in my previous thing, we, in the hamstring injury, we were interested in whether um, weakness, I'm just gonna put, we, uh, well, let's put hamstring weakness post-injury. And notice I didn't put spaces, I put an underscore here. That's important for technical reasons in the program if you want to be able to share the diagram or share the, reproduce the diagram easily. And I'll talk about that after. So that was our question. Does hamstring weakness after an injury cause, let's say performance because we're sport analytics today. So it starts like this. All right. So we're gonna just move these around. I just grab it and drag it. It's that easy. Now we talked about the fact that we're limiting everybody to people who had a hamstring injury. So I double click, that creates a new variable. And here I'm just gonna say hamstring injury creates a variable. We said that the hamstring injury will cause weakness post injury. So I double click on the hamstring injury and then I double click click on the variable that I want to point the arrow. And now we see an arrow from hamstring injury to hamstring weakness post-injury. We also said that the hamstring weakness post-injury is caused by baseline strength. So if you were strong at the beginning of the season, you're more likely to be stronger than somebody who was weaker at the beginning of the season. So let's say this is baseline hamstring strength. Uh, weakness. So this will cause weakness. And we said that the weakness will cause the first hamstring injury. So we draw that arrow. Now we also said that there are other things that cause hamstring injury. Let's say your position, because that requires different things. So your position will cause the first hamstring injury and your position can also affect your performance as well, how many goals you're gonna score or a second injury. Let's say that you have um, uh, speed. Uh, well, let's say not use speed. Let's say you have a connective tissue disorder or I'm just gonna call it frailty. So something that makes you more likely to have an injury. Now, in this case, this frailty, if this was a hamstring injury, then it would be obviously that frailty would cause the injury. So just as a pedagogical thing, I wanna change the name of this. I put my mouse over it 
And all I do is I hit R for rename. And now I'm going to say subsequent injury. Okay, that easy to change the name. Now I'm going to double click on frailty and double click on subsequent injury. So now the question is, if I want to assess the effect of hamstring weakness post-injury on subsequent injury, what do I need to condition on? So the problem here is if I'm looking, all, in order to have this post weakness post-injury, I really have to have had that first injury. So I am forced to restrict the population to those with a hamstring injury. Because I'm restricting the population to that group, I am effectively adjusting for that variable. Statistically, adjusting is and restricting are have the same mathematical thing. Just when you adjust in a statistical model, you're taking a weighted average of two. And in this, you're just looking at the estimate from one. If I want to adjust for this, all I put my mouse over and I hit A. So now I am automatically, uh, I'm in, th that means I'm adjusting for this. So here, what this says is if I want to know about this hamstring weakness, I can still get the answer, but it's not good enough just to adjust for the hamstring injury or just to adjust for position. I have to adjust for either baseline weakness, here's my first one, so I could adjust just for baseline weakness, or I could adjust for both frailty and position. And the reason for this is because here, this hamstring injury is a collider, and it sets up non-causal associations between baseline weakness and position and baseline weakness and frailty. If you notice, this is called the normal graph. And this moral graph puts in the non-causal associations. See, there was no line between these before. So you don't think they're associated, but, but you guys think they're associated because you now know that this is a collider. But somebody who doesn't understand about colliders, you could just say, well, do this, hit the moral graph and you'll see all the different associations. So now baseline weakness and frailty are gonna be associated in the population that had a hamstring injury. Um, but in general, when you guys are using it, you could just leave on the normal and you'll be fine. Here, these are testable implications. That's if you wanted to see if your data fit with the assumptions. And this thing here is very cool because this is the model code. So I'm gonna copy all of this. I just did control A or I'm on a Mac, so it's Command A and Command C, and that copies it. So now I'm gonna to go to here. I just go into Word and now I just paste it, okay? So now I have a copy of that moral code. Now watch what happens. If I go back to any other example, I have a different thing. So I could take this moral code and I could send this to any one of you. You could just copy it. You go into this box, you delete what's there, you paste what's in the Word, you go update DAG, and you've got your diagram back. So it allows you to easily share. You can also, first of all, this tells you how to do things. So how do you want to rename, add, connect? That's very nice. Here you could model and export as a JPEG. And now I just exported it as a JPEG here. And I could just send that JPEG out and you'd have that diagram. The R package does some other things. And so we'll get to some of that. Now, what's very important is the question about uh, longitudinal data, time series data. Notice that I have hamstring weakness here and I have hamstring weakness here and they are separate variables. So in causal inference, you can't have two things causing each other because one has to occur before the other. And so variables are defined in space time, essentially. Einstein, we have time as the fourth dimension, right? So hamstring weakness at baseline is a different variable than hamstring weakness post. 
So you, people say, well, I've got this data and I've got smoking and alcohol and I know smoking and alcohol are associated and smokers go to bars. So if you're a smoker, you start to go to bars, you're more likely to drink. But people who drink are in bars and other people are smoking, so they're more likely to smoke. So I think alcohol causes smoking and smoking causes alcohol. That's true, but it's not precise enough. It's if you are a smoker, you can, smoking can cause you to drink alcohol at a later date, but not at an earlier date. And alcohol can cause you maybe to smoke at a later date, but not at an earlier date. The problem with the data when people are looking at it is they don't know whether the smoking occurred before the alcohol in their data. So they essentially have two measures of hamstring weakness but they don't know which one came first. So if I said, hey, I've got this data, here's a measure of hamstring weakness uh, at one point, and here's a measure of hamstring weakness at another point, but I, I, I lost and I don't know which one was done first. Well, now that's a problem with the structure of your data, and that is gonna limit what you can say in the end, because you actually just don't have a good description of your data. So that's a limitation of many analyses that are done in epidemiology. Hopefully in sport analytics, I, I don't think you'd have that much of a problem. But that's how we deal with time series data is that variables are measured according to time. And so as soon as you do that, it doesn't matter. Because remember, I can rename, I can put any name I want on these variables. The computer doesn't understand the English. All that's important are the causal relationships between the nodes. And that tells you, you say, which node, forgetting about the name, I'm interested in whether this node causes this. These are the causal relationships. Therefore, I have to adjust for this node. Doesn't matter what it's called. So it's all about the causal relationships between variables. And that's the key. All right. Any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Oh, I'm feeling better then. Okay. Okay. Now in the R program, so though, because I know you guys are more statistical than uh, a lot of epidemiologists, applied epidemiologists don't use R, they use other programs. Um, I don't know if they exist in the other epi program, in the other stats programs, but um, Johannes wrote it in R as well. So there's a lot of overlap, but there are some things different. Um, one of the things when you go through the slides, you might want to do this is, is try and identify all the paths from X to Y. So here we have X to Y is one. So we just follow arrows. And the only, um, and in this case, we want every single possible diagram. So we have X to Z5 to Y. Here we have X to Z1 to Z2 to Y. We call some causal and some non-causal. So X to Y mean X is a cause of Y. X causes Z5 causes Y, which means it's a causal path for Y. Here we have X to Z1, but X is not causing Z1. And so we have a non-causal pathway from X to Z1 to Z2 to Y, because X is not causing Y in that case. These are all called open paths because there's no collider. These are all the causal, these are all the paths. All of these here are non-causal. So if you were, when I did this, I think I got 10. I missed six of them. It looks easy. It is really easy to miss some. So if you see here, this is non-causal and blocked at Z5. What does that mean? We have X going to Z5. Now, if we went to Y, that's a causal path that's open. That's the one up here. But we can go X, Z5. I got to remember where this is. Uh, Z2, right? So we have X, Z5, Z2, Y. The issue here is that X and Z2 collide on Z5. So where there's a collider, information doesn't flow. Remember, it only flows if we condition on Z5. So if X, X is, 
a Z1 causes X. So these are associated and these are associated. So X is associated with Z3 unconditionally, right? If I just took X and Z3 and I looked, they would be correlated if they were linear, associated if they're nonlinear, right? Correlation is only for linear. So X and Z3 are gonna be correlated in a linear model. X and Y will be correlated in a linear model if these were just the only relationships. X and Z2, if this didn't exist, X, Z5, Z2, Z, X and Z2 would not be correlated, again, only if these didn't exist, because Z5 blocks it because it's a collider. But if you then condition on Z5, then they would be, uh, it, it would open up a blocked pathway. So when you condition on a collider, the jargon is it opens up a blocked pathway. I know this is difficult to see and it takes some time to work through. So I just, as long as you understand the concept there, don't worry if you get confused. Um, you can send me specific examples where you understand some and don't understand others and I can explain it. Um, you know, this type of stuff is taught over, a, you know, 39 hours in courses and stuff. Um, so let's, now let's go on to what do these arrows actually mean? So there was a question about what does a cause mean mathematically? I can't tell you what the cause means mathematically, but I can tell you what these arrows mean mathematically. These arrows and Pearl's whole approach is called non-parametric. So it's a non-parametric structural equation model. So structural equation modeling is parametric. You make certain assumptions. In the non-parametric, we're not making any assumptions about the distributions of variables. So just some jargon to review. This is graph theory. And we're only talking about directed acyclic graph. There's a lot of other graph theory and, and things can get very complicated very quickly. We talk about vertices and nodes. So this is to help you read other papers if you're reading about it. Some people will say vertices, some people say nodes, some people say variables are joined by edges or by arrows. Edges and arrows are synonymous. So we have X1 and X2 joining Y. Parents cause descendants. So you could think that this is a genealogy. Mom and dad cause the baby. Okay. And if we had causes of mom and dad, they would be grandparents or ancestors of Y and great grandparents or ancestors. So we use these genealogy things. So children are caused by all of their ancestors. Variables are defined in space time. We talked about that blood pressure measured at two different times. So in this particular causal DAG, we have U is unmeasured. And I'm just saying, well, there's something that's causing A to exist. I don't know what it is. I don't have any measure of it. I know that Z is being caused by A, some unmeasured variable, and X. And I know Y is being caused by U, Y, and X. These are structural causal models. All this is saying is that the child is some function of the parents, but we don't know what that function is. This is why it's non-parametric. In structural equation modeling, you are saying, I do know what that function is. And these, when I say function, I mean mathematical function. So we can write this out mathematically that x is equal to ux. That would be one possible function of ux to x. We can say y is some function of uy and x. We don't know what that function is. And z is some function of uz, x, and a. Okay, so this is now mathematical. It's not telling you what the function is, but it is a mathematical description of the, of the causal diagram. And this is very important because there are a lot of there are graphical diagrams and there are graphical causal diagrams. And the graphical causal diagrams have a very intense, elaborate mathematical underpinning that you don't have to know about, but I just want you to make you aware that it exists. And if you are interested, this is what Pearl's genius was, was about applying that mathematical model to take what are basically Bayesian networks and taking them and making them into 
cause, uh, allowing you to causal interpretation. A Bayesian network can go backwards and forwards. There's no causation to it. So when we said x is a function of ux, maybe x is equal to ux, or maybe it's equal to 3 times ux plus 10. This would be a parametric assumption that you would make in a structural equation model. But we're not going to make that. We're going to say, we don't care if it's ux or 3 times ux plus 10. x is just some function of ux. That's all we have to know in order to do it. Well, almost all we have to know. Now, y is some function of uy and x. Maybe it's x squared times uy. Now, this is a subtlety. x and x squared are not really the same variable. So there is some assumption here, uh, because if it was x squared, then Perl's rules would reduce your bias, but would not eliminate it, even in a perfect world with perfect measurement. That's a little subtlety. But if you think that it's 3x or 10x, that wouldn't matter. Now I'm going to give you, it might be that z here, if x is equal to 0, then z is equal to uz times 2. But if x is equal to 1, z is equal to a times x. Again, we have no idea what the function is. And we don't really have to know it in order to use the causal diagrams. And the reason is because the causal diagrams are about conditional independence. So all of that deseparation was essentially saying is if there were no causal effect, are these two variables conditionally independent on the variables that I'm adjusting for? And if they are conditionally independent, that means they're, another way of saying it, that is that they're not associated. And if they're not associated, another way of saying that is in the diagram we saw, there was no line joining the exposure to the outcome after going through those six steps. So it's all about this conditional independence. Some people think of causal diagrams, they don't think about causes. Somebody said mathematical definition of cause. They don't think about it. All they think about is conditional independence. So if you want, that's another way uh, that statisticians think about causation. They don't define it in terms of the way I would, because I'm a physiologist, so I think of actual causes. They just say, oh no, there's no such thing as a cause. There's just conditionally independent and indep conditionally dependent. And if you're not doing a collider, then we're gonna call that a cause. So again, you become circular uh, reasoning. One of the things in these diagrams is that people think that when you uh, draw the diagram and you put an arrow between two variables, you are assuming that one variable causes the other. That's not true. The assumption is the absence of arrows. So the real way, the, the purest way to draw a causal diagram is to put in all your variables and then draw every single arrow between every, put in an arrow between every single variable in both directions. So you'd start off that way. And then you'd say, okay, I'm willing to assume that A does not cause B. So I'm gonna remove the arrow of A causing B or B causing A, whichever. And it's the removal of the arrows that is your assumption, not the presence of the arrow. Um, it's a little bit of semantics, but actually mathematically, and then the underlying mathematical models, it's important. I don't draw my causal diagrams that way because they're a mess and they're hard to see. So I understand that concept. I just don't use it that way. But you should think about that in terms of saying, oh, I don't want to, I'm not, if you're not sure there's an arrow there or not, you put in the arrow because that is going to help you make sure you get um, less, uh, that, that you get an unbiased effect. So the absence of an arrow, it means that A is independent of X. Z is independent of Y given X. So here we have Z. If we look here, so X is independent, A, sorry, A and X are independent because there's no arrow between them. And there's, right, there's no common cause. Z is independent of 
uh, y given x. So here we have a non-causal association, right? We go from z to x, there's no collider. So it's an open non-causal association. In order to block that association, we condition on x. So now we can say z is independent of y, conditionally independent of y given x. Somehow we're fixing x. If x always has the same value, y and z would never be uh, associated. In other words, if I uh, change y, nothing happens to z. Or z is not caused by y. So we're just coming up with different words to mean what conditional independence means. Again, this is a mathematical term. Um, I wanted to say something else here. Here, remember that x is conditionally, is unconditionally independent of uz. So if I don't put anything in the model, x and, x and uz are independent. But if I include z, then x is conditionally associated or conditionally dependent on uz given z. So conditional independence is like no association and condition, uh, given the variables and conditional dependence is association. These are all different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, Ian, can I ask uh, one more question? Yes, so because it no, comes wait. to some of your stuff, yeah. Uh, Dave said uh, I could ask, um, in this diagram, do you assume that the, the U, the error terms um, are uncorrelated? Do you, do you ever allow for them to be correlated? All right, <laughs> see, it's perfect. And, and you're referring to what I talked about before with the actual models, okay? Mm. In Perl's non-parametric structural equation model, and so in Daggety, it assumes these errors are independent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Robbins doesn't use that assumption. Mm -hmm. So you come to different conclusions. Now, if you're talking about the total effect of an exposure on, a, on an outcome, that actually doesn't really matter. Where it matters if you're trying to decompose effects into direct and indirect effects, specifically natural direct effects. So when you try and say, I want to know if the effect, I want to know the effect of use X on Z independent of X. There, the independent errors become very important. Um, there's also something, if you think about what causes the dependence of the errors, it's usually another variable causing a confounder. So that's essentially that you have an, a confounder and you forgot to put it on the graph. So if you think these are correlated, they should be on the graph because then it's a, co, it's a, it's a, a common cause of the exposure and the outcome. However, Jamie Robbins shows in a very convoluted example uh, where that might not be. And he also argues strictly on a quantum, because uh, he, he, he believes in physics too. So uh, on a quantum mechanical level, you can actually have these, well, not even, not even actually, I'm, I'm mixing it up with something else, but he sh there's mathematical examples where you can have um, these errors correlated, even though there's no common cause of them. Okay, I don't. I've heard the examples. I've listened to it, and I can't repeat it because it doesn't. I, I just don't get it. Like it, 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 it's not resonating with me. But statisticians go, "Oh yeah, we know that." So maybe you know that, and that's why it's important. Jamie, when he does it, he doesn't. He's now moved on from these causal DAGs, and he uses something called SWIGs, single world intervention graphs, and they're and single world intervention graphs do not assume. Uh, independent errors. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit more advanced. For those of you at the Society for Epidemiological Research coming up, uh, when it's going to be June 24th, I think, uh, I'm actually the chair of a session. I created a session where I got um, uh, Jamie and Ilya Spitzer and Thomas Richardson. They're giving us a whole session on SWIGs. 
So mm -hmm. if you do like DAGs and you've known in these independent areas and you want to know, know about SWIGs, that's the session that's going to be on it. But you have to register for the conference, obviously, to, to see it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's does that help? Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I, in the next uh, little bit, I want to just talk about sufficient causal sets. This is not something that most, pe most people don't do sufficient causal sets, but I think it's super important because the causal DAGs, remember I told you it was some function. I didn't tell you what the function is, which means there might be interactions and it doesn't deal with interactions. Sufficient causal sets are all about interactions, variables that come together to create a cause. And this was developed, uh, really promoted. Uh, I'm sure it existed before 76, but Rothman wrote about it. And he made these pies. And in this pie, it says that for an outcome to occur, A, B, C, D, and E have to occur together. Or when these occur together, you're going to get the outcome. Now, they don't always have to occur at the same time together. They can be sequential. People make that mistake, but, but they, they occur together. Now, it might also be that you can have the same outcome if A, B, F, G, and H occur. So you can have a goal if one play works, but you also have a, another different type of play. And if everything works, you're gonna also going to get a goal and maybe a third play as well. Now, if you look at these, these are all types of interactions in terms of what we talk about biological interactions. If I was to draw the causal diagram that, you, that we were doing before, this is what it would look like because every one of these is a cause of the outcome. They're all associated with the outcome. So that's what it would look like, but this isn't very helpful. So I like thinking about this, but you can't use those causal DAG rules in the same way. Now, Jamie Robbins and Tyler Vanderwill, Tyler is basically the world expert. I mean, there's Tyler 10 times and then maybe a thousand times and then the next person after him who understands interactions at that level. He's got a huge book on it. It's amazing. Itsuji also has done some work uh, on sufficient causal component causal framework. Um, and so if I just, oops. Oh, here we go. Right. That's what I was looking at. So you might say that E is a cause. So I want to, uh, let's say you're looking at goals, but let's say, it's a, let's say it's a goal against your team. Certain things happen to have a goal against your team. You might say, whoa. You know, every time player E, player E is a cause of goals because they're not a very good defenseman. So I'm going to make sure that player E is not on the field. Okay, that would be good. But we still got these other two causes and E isn't part of these. B might be some particular play or defensive position that you're setting up. And that's involved in two of the causes, but not all three. But maybe A is a different positional setup. And that is actually involved, maybe like I, you have to think about in like multiple dimensions. But maybe <coughs> if A is a common, is common to all three causes, and you block that, now you're going to be able to prevent many more goals than if you just dealt with, did an intervention on E. So when we're trying to think about interventions, I think about the sufficient causal framework. I think it's the only way to do it. And people who are trying to develop interventions, they naturally do this. If we go back to that first video where we had the adolescents, uh, the, the kids playing football, what caused the team to the defense to react? Now, maybe, remember, he did two things. The offensive line didn't move and the ball was snapped, was not snapped between the legs. He just picked up the ball and handed it to the quarterback. It might be that had he had the offensive line not moved, but the ball snapped between the legs, the whole defensive line would have moved. In fact, I would say that's what would have happened. And I would say if he handed the ball to the quarterback and the whole front line moved, that the defense would have reacted as well. It was the combination of the two that messed up the defense. And so if you think about those, he had to actually invoke both of those as interventions in order to achieve the objective he wanted. So I think of sufficient causes as super important. If you think about sport analytics, where you want to change the world, I think this is a very important framework for you to think about. 
the causal diagrams become more difficult. Uh, you have to be more careful, and we'll come to that in a sec. Uh, so this, uh, and we're way over, so I'm, I'm just going to say that normally, if you think about it, you have multiple path causal sets that can cause Y. And <coughs> when we estimate the effect of M on Y from data, we are simply combining all of these and giving you one estimate for the three. And if we want to separate them, we have to measure other variables and then start conditioning and doing things. And, and there are different ways to think about those indirect effects. What is normally done where you just condition on the variable is called a conditional direct effect. And that's uh, a particular thing. And that answers certain questions, but not all of them. We can get into that. That's more advanced stuff. Uh, in other words, uh, when we say there's interaction, remember, if we say M and K are both effects on Y, we might have M affecting Y independent of K and K affecting Y independent of M. That's one possibility in our causal diagram where we just have M and K arrows there. It might be that M affects Y and K only affects Y with M. So we might call K here an effect modifier. It modifies the effect of M. It doesn't have an independent effect, but the DAG doesn't tell us that. We don't know which of those is true, or if this is true, or if there's only an interaction. Remember, it's non-parametric. We don't know the distributions. So these are useful if we want to know the total causal effect. So from a traditional causal uh, DAG, we don't know which one of these is true. The sufficient causal sets diagram tells us this, or it doesn't tell us it's true. It tells us what you think is true, right? The truth is something else, which is causal discovery and things like that. So in this model, what we have is all the different sufficient causal sets of the outcome. So if E1 and E2 occur, we're going to get the outcome. The bar on top means E2 must be absent. So it's not good enough for E3 and E4 to be present. E2 must also be absent. Here, E4 present and E5 absent. If E4 caused it, whether E5 was present or not, then this just wouldn't be there. We would just have E4, E4, D. So these are sufficient causal sets requiring the absence of a variable for one causal um, set and the presence of a variable for another causal set, um, that means what we talk about in, in, in the causal diagrams as a violation of the monotonicity assumption. So monotonicity means that a variable in this context, <coughs> the variable always increases the the chance or always decreases the chance of the outcome, but it doesn't increase and decrease. Now that's a general statement. Causal diagrams can be on a population level, they can be on an individual level. And again, that's getting into more subtleties that go beyond our thing, but I just wanna make sure that you understand um, the general concepts of what we're talking about. If somebody says, uh, they assume monotonicity in order to estimate an unbiased effect. They're saying this cannot exist because this says E2 increases the outcome. The presence of E2 increases the outcome. And this says the absence of E2 increases the outcome. And we can't have both of those. So in summary, <coughs> the Daggety program makes life really much easier for you. Uh, collider stratification bias may be much more common than believed. Obesity paradox is one that I've, I, I wrote a couple of letters about it, and my colleagues have written lots. Uh, it's got about, I don't know, 500 papers and 100 meta-analyses, uh, all showing that if you um, are obese, you have a higher risk of heart failure. But if you have heart failure and you are obese, you do better than somebody who has heart failure and is non-obese. And so that's very similar to the hamstring. Strong hamstrings protect against the first injury. But if you have a hamstring injury, strong hamstrings are predictive of the second injury. So the obesity paradox is an association, not a causal paradox, because Although they could 
do the proper analysis, they haven't. And the people who are writing about it have a vet, I, have either don't, you'd say they don't understand, but we've written about it over and over. There have been debates and they just ignore it um, and continue to write about it. And some people have even said, well, maybe we should be telling people to who have heart attacks to gain weight because people who uh, <coughs> people who are heavier do better. However, there have been a couple of randomized trials that show that if obese people who have heart failure, uh, obese people who have heart failure lose weight, they do better. So the obesity paradox has been proven to be association, non-causal, and yet people are still writing about it. And they say, oh, you know, there's so many articles, how could they all be wrong? The definition of systematic bias is that you keep doing the same thing, but because it's biased, it will always be biased. And when you do a meta-analysis of biased estimates, you're going to get a biased estimate. Um, the other way you can think about that is in diabetes. We have diabetes type one and type two. Diabetes type one is pancreatic islet cell failure. Diabetes type two is due to obesity. So <clears throat> if I tell you that obese people, obesity is a cause of diabetes, you go, yes. If I tell you that people who are obese, the people who are diabetic and you're obese, they're gonna do better than the diabetics who are non-obese. Why? Because the obese diabetic has pancreas that is working and they don't need insulin generally but the non-obese, their pancreas fail, and so they need insulin. And so they have a much more severe form of diabetes. We separate those into two different diseases. We call them diabetes one and diabetes two, or insulin, non-insulin dependent. And so nobody would actually think about saying, obese patients who are, if you're diabetic, you should gain weight. Nobody would ever think about that because they know they're thinking about diabetes type two but they forget the exact same structure, relationships between those variables exist for heart failure. And the exact same structure exists for hamstring injury, looking at subsequent hamstring injury. Causal arrows can be examined through the lens of conditional independence. Again, the mathematical definition, perhaps a mathematical definition, certainly a statistical definition. Um, and then again, you know, sport analytics, <coughs> you want to know how good athletes are at thinking about it on the field. They are always thinking about causes and trying every time they run, try and avoid a tackle. Right. How did he avoid that tackle? He said, this guy's going to go low. I'm going to jump over. Right. So he just somersaults. That is a causal analysis by the athlete in real time in order to apply an intervention. Uh, <coughs> so that's the end. I've gone way over. Uh, well, 10 minutes over. <coughs> I'm happy to stay on. Sorry. I'm just going to get a, a drink of water. I'll be back in a sec because I'm coughing. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe while uh, we're waiting, if uh, you want to put your uh questions in the chat just to sort of give priority. Uh, I will ask you to unmute yourself to ask it. I'm not going to ask it on your behalf. Okay. I, I don't think the dry throat was the only cause of my cough. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have quite, but you see, that's the intervention. Why did I take the drink? I thought, my, so it's all about causes. It's not about association. Right on. I think that that point has been well driven home. Uh, <laughs> so I really appreciate that talk, Ian. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, the you know you really really brought it home the Dagony example, and uh, you know I think I think it became uh, quite clear. Um, so we are uh, going to uh, have time for questions. So for those of you who want to ask, <coughs> uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Maybe while we're waiting, so so I'm just trying to think in terms of sports analytics. I mean, I guess like sometimes we probably select on on winners, right? You you uh, you know maybe that so you know, in the injury example we select on those who have been injured, and then you know this leads to these non-causal associations. Whereas in you know when we're looking at performance, those who are successful are are the ones that we're selecting on, and then these can introduce non-causal associations. Is that a fair analogy? Yes, and it's something that you wouldn't think about right? Because you'd say, oh, I'm going to examine 
the best players and see what they're doing. The problem is now you don't know if the non-best players are doing it more frequently. So let's say a best, you look at the best players and they're always doing something. The implication is that the players who aren't the best are not doing that. And if the, best, if the players who are not doing it are doing even more frequently, you'd come to the exact opposite conclusion. So you have to identify what your whole population is. And, and so you have to take a step back and say, what are you trying to infer? Now, if you, <clears throat> you'd say, well, I'm only gonna make the inference on these players, but now you run into the problem of the heart failure. I'm only interested in people who have heart failure. So I don't have to think about the people who don't have heart failure, but I have to think about the causes of heart failure in order to know what to adjust for. So in this high performance, you might have to say, okay, I have to, I'm only looking at the high performance, that's good, but I have to know about some of the other things that cause these people to be high performers in order to know if I should adjust for that because I might be opening up a non-causal pathway. Right. It seems like, you know, like a lot of this stuff, like, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm oversimplified, but I, and I don't want to do that, but like, you know, it seems like common sense, like some of the things, right? And, uh, uh, you know, like if you do good research, like if you just sort of apl apply some of the principles you might have learned in a research methods course, like you would avoid a lot of problems that, you know, causal analysis ha inference has a, uh, you know, a vernacular for. Um, and there's definitely other things that seem much more or less intuitive that, uh, you know, it's good to have this framework. Uh, but what, you know, to what extent is that, you know, is my statement true that, you know, much of this is common sense and that people, you know, are making basic mistakes. Like, you know, there's some examples in particular, I guess, when I was going through the pre-course work and, you know, the mistake, these, these errors are coming up and it's like, well, yeah, normally we wouldn't, we'd never do that, but I guess people do. Um, right. yeah, so can you maybe comment on that? Yeah. So there's a, a couple of things. One is the course is starting for people, the, the course, the, the readings and stuff, we have to start from a level that we assume no, we don't want to make the assumptions that anybody has any background. Uh, it's also very difficult to unteach somebody once they have certain things. So um, the, for the most part, what science is good at so far and what you've learned is all about the confounding. So remember the whole thing that I said, if you use this, the traditional principles and you were aware of them, you'd be okay in general, um, but you would miss those collider problems. Okay, so the collider is the big, big thing. But the other thing you'd miss is remember that big causal, the, well, if I just go back to, um, hold on. Did I, no, I'm still sharing, that's okay. Yep. So if I go back to this, remember in your world, the way you would do it, you would likely adjust for most of these things. <coughs> And then what you would do is you would be increasing your variance unnecessarily. Okay. And so that's, <coughs> that's a bias variance trade-off that you're doing, but you don't have to, you can now use this and actually get a much more precise estimate. <coughs> God. Um, <coughs> there's, uh, uh, so that's an, one important thing, but <coughs> In terms of the collider, the other thing you have to remember in terms of the collider is that machine learning and artificial intelligence does not know about colliders. So none of those algorithms deal with it. So they will put in a collider because it can, they generally work, <clears throat> I mean, it depends on how they're set up, but they're generally working on minimizing variance, right? So you can actually put in a collider and minimize variance and increase bias. So that's why we don't like them. I mean, and we have a, a paper now that shows, it, it gets even worse than that, but, um, but you can show quite easily that that occurs. So I don't know if you guys, you know, there's a, the IOC, mon the, the, there's a IOC conference that was delayed, uh, injury and prevention conference that'll be in November. So our PhD student will be talking about artificial intelligence and where it goes wrong. And he's done some of that. So that's Tyrell Stokes that I think some of you know. Uh, and so Tyrell's working on it. Um, <clears throat> and it gets even worse 
when you think that there might be an unmeasured confounding. So people always talk about randomized trials and then they do observational and the whole model selection, this is getting more advanced that very few people understand, but <clears throat> the whole model selection process that you use, that we all use, is based on the idea that there's no unmeasured confounding. But the whole thing about the observational study, people say, well, I don't really believe the observational study because I don't want to assume no unmeasured confounding. But then you use a model selection procedure that exactly assumes no unmeasured confounding. And that creates problems because now you might be including variables that will actually increase the bias only in the presence of an unmeasured confounder, but would not otherwise increase the bias. So I think that was like the part of the talk that I gave last time. Um, and so that becomes super important, the way we actually start to evaluate, should we include it or not? And those model selection strategies are sort of what Tyrell was working on, part of his work that he was doing, and hopefully we think is gonna take off in the future in the next 10 years or so as other people start to appreciate how important it is. You meant next 20 years, right? No, that one will be 10. It'll be 10 years for the other methodologists to take it on. It'll be 30 years before it reaches applied practice. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you've been writing about this stuff for a long time. Uh, why has it taken so long to, uh, um, you know, to be uh, appreciated and, and implemented? So Pearl once talked, I was talking with, with Pearl and, and, and Jamie Robbins. And Pearl had this saying that he quoted, I don't know who the original quote was from the 1800s, that science advances one, uh, <clears throat> one um, funeral at a time. <laughs> right. All right. So part of that is that the leaders, you know, when people, people have been doing things for a long time, and it's really hard for some, take uh, like some of my colleagues uh, in sport medicine at research, they don't want to do it. And, and when I ask them, it's, you know, they've been doing something for 15 or 20 years. And now if they accept this, they have to accept in their mind that what they've been doing for 15 or 20 years is wrong. That's a really tough thing to do psychologically. Now, I don't think like that. Um, people say, Ian, you never think you're wrong. You always think you're right. That's not true. It might sound like that. <laughs> but I actually always think that I might be wrong. And I have no problem being wrong. Like, I, it's not part of my identity. But, but at the same time, there are times where I am resistant. And I, if I have a belief, it takes a lot of evidence for me to switch that belief. <clears throat> So they haven't yet been proposed at the evidence. Now, the thing that we did with time to first, second, and third injury is the thing that bothers me the most. Um, because I published that with colleagues and that was just on injury. They continued to, and, and we presented it, at, I presented it at many meetings. And I, and they, everybody just continued to do the same thing instead of, and, and make the same inferences. And, and that bothered me because they were actually part of the research. And, but then I actually asked everybody I knew who had data on concussion and all of those concussion uh, sessions that like all those consensus statements, every one of them knew about this. And I wrote to each of those, to each of the people I knew had concussion data. And I said, please do the proper analysis for concussion because you're all going around saying that if you have a first concussion, you're more at risk of second concussion. You're implying that this is increasing your risk. Having a first concussion increases the risk of second concussion. And that means we're not treating concussion properly. And they just never did it. So I got fed up and in 2018, I did it off the Cirque du Soleil data. And we published that at British Journal of Sport Medicine, and it was the exact same as the injury data that, well, or very similar. So that the first concussion, the time to first concussion and time to second concussion were essentially very similar within the amount of data that we had. Um, actually, if I can, I can take a step to look at that. Um, I didn't, I, I knew I wouldn't have time to show that. <clears throat> um, but Let's see, wait, what am I doing here? Uh, here. Uh, 
and you can see all my computer thing, but uh, let's go here. Whoops, that's it. <clears throat> did I do, did, I don't know if I showed you that in my first talk, probably not. Anyway, I, it, it's, it's in the British Journal of Sport Medicine. And, and, and the key to that <clears throat> is that the people at Cirque du Soleil, every athlete, every artist uh, was following the actual standard protocol. Uh, that we use where you go through the progressive stages and when we when they were all treated according to the recommendations starting 10 years ago so they make some small changes here or there but essentially if you followed the recommendations from 10 years ago to today to to a few years ago when the data was uh, matured um, there was no increased risk and that doesn't mean that if you have a concussion that, is not properly treated, you're not at risk. It doesn't mean the injury data I showed you, those were Cirque du Soleil where you don't have the pressure of playoffs and Grey Cup or Stanley Cup playoffs or whatever it is. Because you don't have that pressure, they don't have the pressure to return the artist to the, to the show too soon. So we feel that, that if you have proper rehab, there is now good evidence that you can get back to the same risk that you had before, okay? That you do not have permanent. So this whole thing that previous injury causes an increased risk, I think there's now good evidence that proper rehab does the right thing and brings you back to the original risk at Cirque du Soleil. We have another paper. Um, I have another paper in British Sport Medicine, which is about picking the right control group. So it's quite tricky. Someone was asking about time series data. Uh, and maybe we can get into that in an, another talk and show you. But, but the actual, if you have time series where the risk of injury is changing over the course of a season, right? Because you're going into playoffs, players become fatigued. There's a bunch of things happening. It's not that every game is exactly the same. And so once you have this changing risk over time, theoretically, now the question is, What's your right control group for the comparison that you want to make to say that you've rehabbed them properly? So now you become, what is the definition of rehab? Is a proper rehab bringing them back to the way they were at the beginning of the season, to the same risk at the beginning of the season? Or should you bring them back to the same risk that they had at the time they were injured? Or should you bring them to the risk that they would have had they never been injured today. So imagine if the risk in playoffs today is high, just because you're playing playoffs more aggressively, it's higher than the risk at baseline. Then if you are in the same state, you're gonna have a higher risk now. But if all I do is compare the risks, I'm gonna say, well, I didn't rehab you properly. Um, so there are th this idea of what is the right, what is your research question and where do you wanna to rehab to, or, and same thing for performance. You know, you're playing against one team versus another team, your performance will shift. So what's the right control group? In soccer, you have mostly the same players, but in hockey, you're changing shifts all the time. So Tyrell's actual PhD thesis that he was supposed to start, and hopefully we'll get back to soon because he got off on this great tangent, but um, it'll be the third chapter, is actually about what is the right control group that we should use as these timeframes are changing. Uh, and how can we analyze return to play? What Should we have returned the person to play now or should we wait a week? And, and, and you can think of that on a performance level or an injury risk level. If I bring them back too soon, their performance is down and their risk of injury is high, but maybe their performance is good enough that I want to include them. I don't know. So that, that becomes a much more complicated question. And then how do you analyze it when the players are changing and the teams are changing? And is a team today the same as the team last year? Uh, and so those become much more complicated questions. So that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Uh, please, anyone from the audience, uh, now would be a great time uh, to ask a question. I think there's something in the chat form here. There's a couple in the chat, Max Planck, uh, so I don't know what that's about. From my personal experience, subsequent concussions have occurred a lot more easily. <clears throat> well, 
one of the things um, that occurs, one, I don't know how you were treated. Uh, I don't know if that's talking about you or, or by other people. Uh, so it's about making sure that people are properly treated and don't go back too soon. That's number one. Uh, <clears throat> remember that the, um, when we talk about causal effects, in general, we are talking about average causal effects. So this is on average. So it might be, and remember, if we have an intervention that makes half the people better and half the people worse by exactly the same amount, those are true causal effects, but the average causal effect is no. And whenever we're doing statistics, it's always on the average causal effect. It is never on an individual level. You cannot do statistics on one person. And even if you think, oh no, but I could do repeated measures, N of one designs, that's still an average causal effect for the person. It might be at some points in time, the treat in that individual, the treatment is beneficial. And at other points in time in that person, the treatment is harmful. And if they're exactly opposite and in the same magnitude, the average causal effect in that person will be nothing. So again, it comes back to questions. And part of a causal inference is really trying to say, getting much more specific, I guess it comes back to Dave's question, is you have to be much more, it forces you to be much more specific in what your question is, because now you have to decide, are you talking about average or interactions and, and subject level? Um, so that's part of what I, I really like. Oh, Max Planck, science, okay, makes progress, funeral by funeral. Um, and that's, so sample size of one from, from the person who wrote that. Uh, and, and I would say that that is probably, uh, the question is, one of the things that may have happened is improper rehab. So just as a clinical thing, a lot of the symptoms from concussion are actually probably not because of brain damage. So we know that trigger points that occur. So when you get a concussion, think about it. The concussion has to occur. It's not a blow to the head in general. It is an acceleration deceleration injury. Because if I take a hammer and I hit your head, you don't get a concussion, right? That's a big blow, but there's no concussion because it's in a closed skull. So what causes the concussion is shear forces that occur as the brain accelerates and decelerates. That's the prevailing theory. There are some things like grenades or something where you get a huge concussive blow and that air force actually causes, gets transmitted through the bone, but the brain is still moving. So I would still say that that is still an acceleration deceleration injury. It's just the head's not. So now we have that effect that it's an acceleration deceleration injury. And that acceleration deceleration is occurring in the head. The brain is what's getting damaged and we call a concussion. But when the head accelerates and decelerates, so does the neck. And so many, many concussions are associated with neck injuries. Now I can actually cause a neck injury and make sure that there's no concussion. And neck and muscle injuries sometimes develop what are called trigger points. We don't actually understand the pathology of trigger points, but we can identify them and we can actually reproducibly show their consequences. And some of those consequences are headache, nausea, dizziness, it's a concussion. So if, if, if you have an acceleration, deceleration of your head and you have those three symptoms, you have a concussion. In fact, if you have a, there's papers that define a concussion by a headache after head trauma, even though that's true statistically, but there are other reasons. So you can get um, migraine, traumatic induced migraines, which are not concussions. So there are other things, but if you go to a clinician, even a sport medicine clinician, and you said, you whacked your head and now you're feeling dizzy and have a headache, it's gonna be a concussion by default. And if we find some neck symptoms, we're gonna say you had a concussion plus you have some neck symptoms. It might be that it's all the neck problem. And so in Calgary, they did a lot with vestibular ocular stuff and they're talking about that. And so what'll happen 20 years from now again, is we will become better at de defining and reducing concussion syndrome into its components. So you also have to, in medicine, a syndrome 
is a constellation. This is the actual definition of a syndrome: constellation of symptoms and signs that all that a constellation of similar symptoms and signs that has multiple causes. So we call it a concussion syndrome. We know it has multiple causes. What'll happen is we will become better at identifying when there are isolated neck causes of this constellation of headache, nausea, dizziness, whatever, uh, and when these things are caused by brain injury. And then we will say, okay, these neck things, you still can't play because if you play, you're gonna get worse and worse. So we still have to make you better, but we're not gonna call that a concussion anymore. We'll call that a neck injury, pure neck injury. Right now, none of us do it because we're all chicken, right? It's, it's like a big thing to say, oh, it's just a neck injury. Therefore you can play and you don't have a brain injury because we have no way of actually diagnosing if the brain has been functionally damaged. Structurally damaged, yes. We could see if there's blood in the brain. We can see if, there, uh, if you have got a bleed. We could see you know, if there's a fracture, but we can't see if the intracellular um, sarcoplasmic, well, it's not sarcoplasmic because that's muscle, but if the endoplasmic reticulum is working, if the neurons, the, the cytoskeleton is damaged, if the transport along that cytoskeleton is damaged, because all of that is going to deteriorate, change the function of the neurons. And if we can't see it, that's basically where we think the concussion, the actual brain injury is occurring in those things. So again, I, I'm very good at long answers to short questions. <laughs> no problem. That's fascinating. Well, I you know, especially appreciate the physiology uh, part of it because that's my yeah. more my angle. But uh, so okay, just to review then, the neck issues do the trigger points or some sort of issue in the neck can cause the same symptoms as concussion itself, and we're not sure. We can't obviously uh, decouple those from the actual causes. Uh, so whether it's neck or brain functional brain damage. Yeah, and, and the stuff that Calgary is doing at the stibular ocular is more about thinking about the actual cranial nerves and are there's damage there. And so you could even think of those as concussion. I'm telling you, I can, I have, I had a patient today uh, who um, basically has any time she has any stress on her neck, or even she said, if she is lifting things that are heavy, because you've got to contract your whole core, right? Which includes your neck in order to stabilize. She lifts heavy things. She gets neck. She gets a headache and eye pain, and she starts to feel dizzy. So that was in my office today. Happened to be by coincidence. Wow. So that the fact that she is just lifting something, causing it. I don't know many clinicians who would think that that's a brain injury, although you could make some arguments that you've got increased central programming. So you've got increased attention, but, but what she was describing was lifting like, Oh, if I lift 20 pounds in each arm, I get a headache like that. Uh, and we don't, yeah, it's not repetitive, heavy exercise that she's doing. Yeah. Um, and then I just press on her neck and she goes, Oh, that's my headache. And uh, I said, you feel nauseous. She goes, no, but it's the nausea usually comes when the headache's been going on for like, 30 seconds or something. Hmm. So those are, those are anyway, we're sort of off that whole causal stuff, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, well, maybe now's a good time to stop the recording. And before I do, I just want to thank you very much for a fantastic uh, presentation and, uh, you know, for uh, this first part of the, uh, the causal inference short course. So, you know, this coupled with the materials that you suggested has really uh, helped me a lot. Uh, I certainly have a long way to go. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, definitely I'm, I'm far less ignorant and far more better informed for analyzing some of these more, ob you know, observational uh, analyses and whatnot. So thanks very much. Okay. And yeah, I, I would like to make the plug for Miguel. I mean, the book is great if you like to read. And the, uh, the MOOC is, is great if you just like visual and, and stuff. Yeah. And it's really, he starts at the beginning and he walks you through. And one of the things is I didn't, I told you how you could solve the collider stratification problem in some contexts. There's other contexts where you cannot do it through regression at all. And so then there are other statistical methods to use and he explains them. Essentially, it's the equivalent of standardization. So if yeah. you're aware of standardization, kind of like standardized mortality ratios or those, it's using the same principles, 
uh, and it just it's it's actually explains them better in and in, in, in terms of understanding how they work. Uh, it's very nice. So I'd really try and plug those. And Miguel is just really uh, the best knowledge translation person I've ever met. If I can tell my one joke before we go, uh, mm -hmm. I was talking to him and I said uh, we're a group of people, and I I, I, was, I was just knew him very briefly at the time. Now I know him well, but I said, Miguel, I don't understand how you can write so well. And, uh, you know, it's just so clear. And he goes, Ian, if you can think clearly, you can write clearly. And I go, but you're Spanish. He's, your first language is Spanish. He goes, Ian, you can think clearly in any language. So, um, and so everybody laughed and because none of us are as good as him. So it was a little bit of a put down, but completely appropriate. And, yeah. uh, and he is really, he takes the time in his writings and in the MOOC to actually go through it. So I encourage you to go to it. And then after you do, you'll go, Ian, like you should take lessons on presenting because you could have done it his way. If he'd done it, it would have been that much better. And I just, I really can't emphasize it how much one of my colleagues who I've worked with and I've, I've sort of helped uh, along, uh, he looked at it. He goes, why did you tell me to look at this three years ago? Because it would have helped me so much, you know? Um, yeah. And that's after all my teaching. So I said, yeah, thanks. Yeah. The, the MOOC is, uh, that's what I sort of, you know, focused mostly on. And yeah, it's crystal, crystal clear. So I, it, you know, that was a great suggestion. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely be referring many people to it. All right. Thanks again. And I'm just going right. to um, stop the recording.